welcome aspirants as you all know upsc announced the results for its preliminary examinations more than 927 candidates cleared from our academy and in that 70 of them cleared in their first attempt we congratulate everyone who have cleared the preliminary examination good evening aspirants welcome to the hindu news analysis by shankar ias academy for the date 5th of july 2022 these are the list of news articles we will be discussing today look here Today's lead editorial article is written by Mr T P Srinivasan sir. He is a 1967 batch IFS officer. Sir has also served as a ambassador for India. All his articles are very relevant for our examination due to his vast experience in the field. Follow his articles regularly and note on the points he discussed. In this editorial sir has mentioned about the issues associated with the multilateral forums. While he points out the issues with these forums, Sir has mentioned that bilateral relations and engagements are more productive comparatively. To substantiate his points, Sir mentions limited gains that India made in multilateral forums like Quad, BRICS, and G7. Comparing to these limited gains, the progress that India made during our Prime Minister's visit to UAE is immense. So, through this editorial, Sir argues that. bilateral engagements may be much more productive at this point in history so this is about the editorial for people who are not aware sir is handling weekly international relations sessions for our academy this is a free initiative of shankar ayes academy we have already uploaded 75 videos as a part of this program for people who are preparing for mains examination you can follow the videos it will help you prepare fodder material for your international relation related topics so do use the initiative now moving on look at this article see this oped article talks about the recently released draft e waste management rules 2022 as you know since the last decade lot of amendments have been made to the e waste management and handling rules among them the draft e waste management rules 2022 is the most recent one It was released for public comments in May 2022 by the Environment Ministry. And as the title of the article insists, the authors say that the draft policy has right intent but confusing content. So, this is the crux of the OPED article given here. In this context, let us quickly go through some of the important points mentioned in the news article. See here, I have displayed the syllabus relevant to this discussion. Just go through it. Now let us start our discussion. First, let us understand what is e-waste. See, e-waste is short for electronic waste, and the term is used to describe old end-of-life or discarded electronic appliances. Here, end-of-life of a product means the time when the product is intended to be discarded by the user. Or in other words, e-waste means electrical and electronic components or parts of electronic components. that are discarded as waste e waste also includes the electronic and electrical parts that are rejected during manufacturing refurbishment and repair process here note that solar photovoltaic cells panels and modules are also classified as e waste here e waste management and handling rules is nothing but rules made for effective management of production and disposal of e waste remember these rules shall apply to every manufacturer refurbisher and recycler who are involved in the production sale transfer purchase and processing of e waste or electrical and electronic equipment also note that these rules are not applicable to used batteries packaging plastics micro enterprises and radioactive waste why because these materials are ruled under specific separate rules for each of them now coming back to the draft e waste management rules 2022 this draft policy retains the extended producer responsibility framework so what is this extended producer responsibility framework or epr see in general extended producer responsibility is a policy approach under which producers are given a significant responsibility for the treatment or disposal of post consumer products the purpose behind this epr approach is to provide incentives to prevent waste at the source itself 
it also aims to promote product designs that is environmentally friendly and support the achievement of public recycling and materials management goals now according to the rules the extended producer responsibility refers to the responsibility of every producers of the electrical and electronic equipment for channelization of e-waste to the authorized dismantler or recycler to ensure environmentally sound management of such waste here according to the rules recycler means any person who is engaged in recycling and reprocessing of waste electrical and electronic equipments so the rules retain this epr framework now let us see some of the significant changes in the rules and the opinions of the authors about the new draft e waste management and handling rules 2022 firstly the draft rules states that producers of e waste have to ensure that at least 60% of their produced e waste is recycled by 2023 see this is a major change because in the previous years targets were set for collection rate that is target was set for the collection of e waste as a percentage of quantity of products sold by weight in the market this shift from the collection rate targets in the previous year to the recycling target set in the proposed rule is a very prominent change the authors of this article feel that the 60% recycling rate target that has been set is too optimistic that is it is too unrealistic the attainment of the 60% recycling target according to the authors is both technically and economically not feasible in india okay the second major change is the introduction of market for e waste recycling certificates according to the authors the proposed market for e waste recycling also appears unrealistic they have stated two reasons for it the first reason is that india is still in its infant stage when it comes to large scale recycling of e waste this is due to the fact that most of the recycling of valuable materials is carried out within the informal sector using inefficient and unsafe technologies the second reason stated by the authors is that if the new rules and the mandated changes were to create a market for recycling then the existing formal and informal players in the recycling sector should have to play an important role but the new draft rules did not mention anything about who will regulate the registered collectors dismantlers and producers responsibility organizations because of these two reasons the proposed market for e waste recycling certificates appears to be unrealistic according to the authors here the authors also mention about europe where similar provision was already implemented what the europe experience shows us is that recycling targets are difficult to enforce by the regulators compared to the collection targets this is because enforcing recycling targets can become pretty technical at times here take for example if the government is mandating a recycling target of e waste that is 60% of the total weight must be recycled here in this scenario what the producers will do is that they will recycle the easy to recycle components like plastic copper and glass since these components are little heavy the producers can easily attain the 60% weight target that is set by the regulation here what you have to note is that in this particular scenario the producers will not recycle the difficult to recycle materials like cadmium mercury and arsenic see these materials are the most damaging to the environment instead of recycling this the producers will only recycle easy to recycle components like plastic copper and glass so this whole mechanism will be counterproductive so what the author suggests is that the central pollution control board that is the cpcb must come up with a clear set of guidelines about the 60% recycling targets and they have to also give guidelines about how the recycling should have to be done see this has to be ensured to achieve the real intention of the rules okay moving on thirdly as i already said the informal sector accounts for a vast majority of e waste processed in india 
various experts are of the opinion that informal sector must be integrated into the formal systems but the proposed regulations have placed the responsibility of such integration on the state governments the regulation while pushing the responsibility to the state governments did not specify the incentive for them to do so so according to the authors the formalization of e-waste recycling will be difficult to achieve finally the new draft regulation introduced the steering committee the main role of the steering committee is to oversee the overall implementation monitoring and supervision of the regulations we saw that the new regulations introduced the concept of e-waste recycling certificates right it is this committee that is the steering committee that issue the certification in this committee chairman of the central pollution control board acts as the chairperson of the committee the steering committee also has representatives from the environment ministry ministry of electronics and information technology and it also has representatives from the associations of producers and recyclers the issue with the steering committee according to the authors of this article is that they lack representation in it the committee lacks representation from scientist academist and social sector and civil society organizations this is the final issue with the new draft e waste management and handling rules 2022 cited by the authors of this oped article see the new regulation not just has negatives to it it also has some positive aspects as well the authors have also highlighted some of the positive aspects in relation to the rules in this article itself now let us see them first is the new regulation expands the definition of e waste okay secondly the new rules has specified the penalties for violation of the rules more clearly the next is the new rules has introduced the concept of polluter pays through this an environmental compensation fund has been created finally the new rules has also recognized the informal waste workers see these are some of the positives with the draft regulation so to conclude even with all the above mentioned positives the authors mentioned that the new epr framework needs a clear guidelines to be implemented successfully that's all regarding this news article discussion see it is for articles like this we have to refer newspapers even though we can refer government sources and chart down major points in the government policies we need well written articles like this to find the issues with the government policies see the upsc post 2014 has mostly focused on opinion based questions rather than fact based questions in the mains examination we are all just learners here just by reading the government policies we cannot generate good informed opinions this is where editorials and oped articles play a crucial role by going through enough editorials like this during our preparation journey we can give well written answers for opinion based questions in our mains examination see there will be a mains question based on this discussion at the end of the video i have noted that only two aspirants have been writing answers regularly others if you have not yet started the practice of answer writing start today itself read the question come back to the video hear it once again close the video and write the answers using the points from your memory this will help you build long term memory one advice from me for people who are planning to write their first answer today is that do not aim for perfection in the first attempt perfection will eventually come through enough practice the thing that you have to focus today is putting pen to paper and writing just an answer that's all i hope you guys didn't find the thing that i shared at the end of the video to be too preachy i am just sharing my experience and helping you guys learn from my mistakes okay with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article look at this editorial in this editorial the author of the editorial is focusing on the nutritional status of our country many government schemes or programs in this regard has paid off but still our country lacks in the malnutrition intervention process so author is suggesting to scale up direct nutritional intervention 
in this manner author has also pointed out the focus areas so in this discussion let us see the nutritional schemes that are effective according to the author the flaws in the schemes where improvement is needed and what needs to change to eradicate malnutrition in our country before getting into the discussion i have displayed the syllabus regarding the discussion you can go through it when we say nutrition it refers to the process of providing or obtaining the food that is necessary for health and growth if nutrition and health are two sides of the same coin then food is the single factor responsible for both nutritional needs differ with age it rises throughout childhood peaks in adolescence and then levels of or even diminishes as the teenager becomes an adult so proper nutrition during childhood and adolescence is what decides our health if this is not present then it leads to wide range of health issues mainly malnutrition when the prefix mal is added to any word it means it is inadequate or improper so malnutrition simply means inadequate nutrition or improper nutrition that is why we say malnutrition is a general term that refers to all forms of poor nutrition it most often refers to undernutrition which is inadequate nutrition resulting from inadequate consumption of nutrients poor absorption of nutrients or excessive loss of nutrients this results in true forms of undernutrition like wasting which is having low weight to height then stunting which is low height for age finally underweight which refers to low weight for age but here don't forget that malnutrition not only includes undernutrition but also overnutrition also overnutrition is the opposite of undernutrition which means getting more nutrients than needed this is what earlier we saw as improper nutrition overnutrition also causes problems as it leads to excessive intake of specific nutrients and results in lacking of some nutrients there is an imbalance here so overall it leads to overweight obesity and diet related non communicable diseases like heart disease stroke diabetes and even some cancers so a simple malnutrition causes all these issues and if the same happens in childhood and adolescence which are crucial stages of growth and development then the damages will be serious and lasting it not only affects the health and the survival of the individual and families but also the countries and their economy this is because of the simple social impacts like diminished learning capacity and poor school performance see these simple social impacts can translate into reduced earnings and increased risk to the above mentioned chronic diseases in adulthood so here what is india's position in india the undernutrition status is captured by the national family health survey based on the data we cannot say the situation is better but improvement can be seen in malnutrition indicators here you can see the survey results of national family health survey 4 and national family health survey 5 according to the author this child malnutrition in india is attributing to 68.2 percentage of the under 5 child mortality see this slight improvement in malnutrition indicators may be insufficient but it cannot be disregarded also because it is a sign that the schemes and the programs of the central and the state governments are slowly bearing fruits mainly Central government's Poshan Abhiyan is responsible for this. Here Poshan stands for Prime Minister's Overarching Scheme for Holistic Nutrition that was launched in 2018. It is also called the National Nutrition Mission. It is Government of India's flagship program to improve nutritional outcomes for children, pregnant women and lactating mothers. So the program directs the attention of the country towards the problem of malnutrition and addresses it in a mission mode for this the mission ensures convergence of various programs that is anganwadi services pradhan mantri matru vandana yojana scheme for adolescent girls etc the program has set targets for reducing the levels of malnutrition indicators 
it includes reducing stunting by 2 percentage per annum further it was also agreed that the mission would strive to achieve reduction in stunting from 38% to 25% by 2022 then reducing undernutrition as a whole by 2% per annum it also aimed to reduce anemia among young children women and adolescent girls by 3 percentage per annum and final target was to reduce low birth weight by 2 percentage per annum from the national family health survey data we can say that these targets were not achieved fully but they have been achieved to some level particularly the target relating to stunting was not at all achieved 38.4 percentage existed in the national family health survey 4 but it could only be reduced to 35 0.5 percentage and not 25 percentage by 2022 as it was aimed why did this happen it happened because poshan abhiyan focused on nutrition sensitive interventions it did not focus on direct nutrition intervention here you have to understand about direct nutrition intervention and nutrition sensitive interventions direct nutrition intervention is also called nutrition specific intervention it addresses the immediate cause of undernutrition such as inadequate dietary intake and diseases such as inadequate dietary intake diseases or poor health status direct nutrition intervention is targeted on first 100 days of life which is from pregnancy to first 2 years of a child's life that is 270 days of pregnancy and then after birth up to 24 months which is about around 730 days direct nutritional intervention is also targeted on women in reproductive age and adolescent girls so here what are the interventions first good nutrition practices including adequate food and nutrition intake for example iron and folic acid and vitamin a supplements and deworming for women second is feeding caregiving and parenting practices this includes diarrhea control promotion of good feeding and hygiene practices for infants and young children and finally national breast feeding promotion campaigns third is lowering the burden of infectious diseases for example providing preventive treatments for malaria during pregnancy fourth is provision of micronutrients for example fortification of staple foods and finally the treatment of severe acute malnutrition also note that for the indian context unicef has mapped 17 direct nutritional interventions as you can see here now come to nutrition sensitive interventions it is also called indirect nutrition intervention these addresses the underlying cause are determinants of undernutrition so it includes programs to improve food security to improve access to health security and health services provision of adequate caregiving resources at the individual household and community levels and providing a safe and hygienic environment it involves actions from a range of sectors such as health agriculture poverty alleviation water sanitation hygiene education food security and overall social protection note that indirect nutritional interventions help to enhance the scale of direct nutritional interventions so both direct nutritional interventions and indirect nutritional interventions should be undertaken simultaneously to holistically address the problem of undernutrition let's get back to portion of your now see as i said it focused on nutrition sensitive intervention or indirect nutrition interventions because the interventions indirectly impacted mother infant and young children's nutrition such as it improved the coverage of maternal child health services it also enhanced women empowerment there was enhanced availability and access to water sanitation and hygiene services it also encourages homestead food production for a diversified diet so in case of poshan abhiyan there is no focus on nutrition specific interventions or direct nutritional intervention this was also clearly manifested in the national family health survey results for example if we take child feeding practices the data is worrisome only 63.7% children under the age of 6 were exclusively breastfed 
exclusive breastfeeding means the babies are given only breast milk and nothing else like they are not given any other milk food or drinks or even water it seems like the government realized this lacking in the poshan abhiyan so it launched the mission poshan abhiyan 2.0 this 2.0 also addresses the challenges of malnutrition but through a strategic shift in nutrition content and delivery this is by creating a convergent ecosystem to develop and promote practices that nurture health wellness and immunity portion 2.0 is envisaged as an integrated nutrition support program that seeks to optimize the quality and delivery of food under the supplementary nutrition program for this portion 2.0 brought three programs under its ambit namely anganwadi services scheme for adolescent girls and poshan abhiyan through this now the focus is on maternal nutrition infant and young children feeding norms treatment of moderate acute malnutrition and severe acute malnutrition and finally wellness through ayush so we can say government is on the right track to tackle under nutrition but another problem is that even other interventions other than poshan abhiyan that focused on direct nutritional interventions did not give desired results here let us take the example of breastfeeding again our country has the policy on infants and young child feeding since 1983 along with this there is a ban on sale of commercial milk for infant feeding under the infant milk substitutes feeding bottles and infant foods regulation of production supply and distribution act 1992 but still there is only a marginal improvement in the practice of exclusive breastfeeding so based on these the author has given certain suggestions for improvement first is creating awareness on exclusive breastfeeding and breastfeeding counseling to pregnant mothers this should include promoting the technique of appropriate holding of baby for exclusive breastfeeding this is required for optimal transfer of breast milk to the baby the second is ensuring antenatal checkup or antenatal care visits and follow up through frequent home visits antenatal care allows the pregnant woman to learn healthy behaviors warning signs during pregnancy and childbirth etc they also get the access to micronutrient supplementation and required treatments third is promoting good complementary feeding practices and avoiding poor complementary feeding complementary feeding means providing complementary foods in addition to breast milk see exclusive breast feeding is for 6 months and around the age of 6 months the an infant's need for energy and nutrition starts to exceed so breast milk plus complementary foods are necessary to meet those excess needs according to the world health organization if complementary foods are not introduced around the age of 6 months and if they are given inappropriately then an infant's growth may falter but remember just like that you cannot provide anything first at 6 months they should be given pureed mashed and semi solid foods then by 8 months finger food shall be given like this appropriate complementary feeding practices should be followed now many of these are already undertaken under portion 2.0 but it needs to but it needs a solid push so author suggests to invest finances and energies for greater thrust to portion 2.0 finally the author suggests revisiting the integrated child development scheme it is an old scheme launched in 1975 and it could not controlled child undernutrition so it can be revamped or modified into a different scheme the conclusion is the overall emphasis should be on adequate nutrition in the first 100 days of life of a child to tackle the menace of malnutrition okay that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw some of the positive results from the government's malnutrition intervention program we also saw some issues with the current scheme of things we saw the difference between direct nutritional interventions and the indirect nutritional interventions we saw the advantages associated with indirect nutritional interventions and the issues that needs to be addressed in case of indirect nutritional interventions and finally we saw about the portion 2.0 we also saw 
some of the suggestions given by the author to improve the overall health profile of our country with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article see this article here this article states that the dmk had assumed power in tamil nadu a year ago but it is still unclear how it is proceeding against corrupt officials while he was in the opposition dmk leader mukka stalin would often say that once elected to power his government would jail corrupt ministers of the aadmk resign in december 2020 mr stalin met the then governor banwarlal prohit seeking prosecution of the then chief minister edapadi k palnisami and others he submitted a 98 page memorandum listing specific charges of corruption between 2016 and 2020 against the then cm and his ministers mr stalin said that under section 17a of the prevention of corruption amendment act 2018 the governor could himself take action against them but till now no significant action is taken this is the essence of the article given here in this context let us learn about prevention of corruption amendment act 2018 and its major provisions see the prevention of corruption act 1988 is an act of the parliament of india enacted to combat corruption in government agencies and public sector businesses in india any citizen who is a government servant if caught in malpractice can be arrested on the charges of violation of this law central and state government is empowered to appoint special judges to try the offenses the offenses that are covered under the prevention of corruption act 1988 includes taking gratification other than legal remuneration in respect of an official act the next thing is taking gratification in order to influence public servant by corrupt or illegal means the next thing is taking gratification for exercise of personal influence with public servant and finally any public servant who commits criminal misconduct so these are the offenses that are covered under the prevention of corruption act 1988 the section 13 of the prevention of corruption act 1988 is particularly important section 13 of the act holds public servants culpable for securing a monetary advantage for another without any public interest that is if a civil servant does an act that resulted in a monetary advantage to another person without any underlying public interest then the civil servant himself is culpable under section 13 see this provision that is The section 13 of Prevention of Corruption Act 1988 resulted in many honest officials being prosecuted even when they gained nothing and merely exercised their discretion in favor of someone. So the act was amended in the year 2018, okay? In addition to this, some other changes were also made in the 2018 amendment. Now we will see some of the key features of the Prevention of Corruption Act 2008 amendment okay see the act redefines the provisions related to criminal misconduct to only cover two types of offenses the first one is fraudulent misappropriation of property and the second one is illicit enrichment such as amassing of assets disproportionate to one's known source of income The Amendment Act also introduces the offence of giving bribe as a direct offence. See, after the amendment, people who are giving bribe is also culpable. However, a person who is compelled to give a bribe will not be charged with offence if he reports the matter to law enforcement authorities within seven days. So, take note of it. Thirdly. Before a police officer conducts an investigation into an offence alleged to have been committed by a public servant prior approval of the relevant government or competent authority should be taken such approval would not be necessary in cases which involves the arrest of a person on the spot on the charge of taking a bribe so for investigation they have to seek government approval and for spot arrest government approval is not necessary no moving on fourthly the act mandates that effort should be made to complete the corruption trail 
by the special judge within 2 years this period may be extended for up to 6 months at a time in case of extension the reason for such extension must be recorded in writing however the total period for completion of the trial should not exceed 4 years okay then the amendment made that those convicted of taking bribes can be imprisoned for 3 to 7 years besides being fined finally it makes a provision for providing protection to the coerced bribe givers that is people who are forced to give bribe if the matter is reported to the concerned law enforcement authority within a week all these provisions are meant to prevent corruption in india the author of this article questions tamil nadu chief minister mr muka stalin that why he had not used any of these provisions to charge corrupt officials in the previous aadmk government that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about section 13 of prevention of corruption act 1988 and then we saw the major provisions of the prevention of corruption amendment act 2018 with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article see this article here this is the final article we will be discussing today this news article mentions about the guidelines for hotels and restaurants issued by the central consumer protection authority as per the guidelines consumers cannot be forced to pay service charges in hotels or restaurants so service charge cannot be added to the bill this is based on the principle that service is inherent in the price of food and beverages so this makes any payment of service charge by the customer as voluntary optional and at the customer's discretion any violation of this rule can be reported to the national consumer helpline or filed as a complaint with the consumer commission or the district collector see remember this when you order food next time now from the exam perspective let us see about the central consumer protection authority that is ccpa See it is a statutory body established under the Consumer Protection Act 2019. It was established in 2020 under the Section 10 of the Consumer Protection Act 2019. It is the central authority to regulate matters relating to violation of rights of consumers and unfair trade practices. It also regulates matters relating to false or misleading advertisements which are prejudicial to the interest of public and the consumers overall this authority is responsible for promoting protecting and enforcing the rights of consumers as a class so basically the central authority has the regulatory mandate as opposed to advisory domain of the consumer protection councils which are also established under the act see any violation can be written as a complaint and submitted to the central authority or even to the district collector the authority also has the sumo to power to conduct inquiry or investigation on the violation of consumer rights or unfair trade practices the same can be based on directions from the central government also see i have displayed here some other functions of the central consumer protection authority just go through it now moving on see if sufficient evidence is found to show violation by a person then the authority that is the central consumer protection authority has the power to order or recall of goods or withdraw services which are dangerous hazardous or unsafe the authority can also order reimbursement of the prices of goods or services so recall to purchases of such goods or services the authority can also order for discontinuation of a practice which are unfair and prejudicial to consumers disinterest additionally the central consumer protection authority has the power to impose penalty of rupees 10 lakhs and on subsequent violation a penalty up to 50 lakhs can be imposed note that the central consumer protection authority is headquartered in the national capital region of delhi now let us come to the composition of the authority it consists of a chief commissioner and other commissioners currently there is one additional commissioner they are appointed by the central government it also includes a team of subject matter experts and professionals the central consumer protection authority also has a investigation wing headed by a director general that's all regarding this discussion 
in this discussion we saw some of the basic points about central consumer protection authority with this let us conclude the news article discussion session and take up the practice prelims questions we have three questions today let us go through them one by one let us take up the first question this question is about prevention of corruption act 2018 two statements are given we have to find the correct statement let us take up the first statement there is a provision to punish the bribe taker but there is no provision to punish the bribe giver see this statement is incorrect both the bribe giver and the bribe taker are liable to be punished under the prevention of corruption amendment act 2018 Here, the person who is forced to give a bribe will be protected only if he reports the incident to the law enforcement authority within seven days. See this we saw in the discussion itself. So, statement one is incorrect. Moving on, let us take up statement two. If the trial is not concluded within two years, the special judge should state the reason for extending the trial beyond two years. See this statement is correct. The act mandates that the trial should be conducted by the special judge within two years. This period may be extended for up to six months at a time, but the reason for the extension must be recorded in writing. However, the total period for the completion of the trial should not exceed four years. So, statement two is correct. So, the correct answer here is option B, two only. Now, let us take up the second question. See, this is a three-statement question. Three statements about Central Consumer Protection Authority is given. We have to find the correct statements. Take the first statement. It is a statutory body. See, this is true. The Central Consumer Protection Authority is a statutory body established under the Consumer Protection Act 2019. Moving on to the second statement, it has the power to impose penalty up to 50 lakhs. See, this statement is also correct. When someone repeats a violation on the provisions of the Act. then the authority that is the central consumer protection authority can impose 50 lakhs penalty the third statement the orders of the central consumer protection authority are final and binding see this statement is incorrect the orders of the central consumer protection authority is not final final would mean no appeal can be filed but it is not so a person aggrieved by the orders passed by the central authority may file a appeal to the national consumer disputes redressal commission it has to be filed within a period of 30 days from the date of receipt of such orders so statement 1 is correct statement 2 is correct and statement 3 is incorrect so the correct answer here is option c 1 and 2 only now look at this question see this question is about national nutrition mission It is a four statement question we have to find the correct statement see it is a previous year question take this as a quiz question and post your answers in the comment section with this let us conclude the practice prelims question session so i have displayed here two main question based on today's discussion just go through the question and like i said go back to the video just listen to the video once again and chart down your answer you no need to focus on perfection just putting your pen to paper and writing an okay answer in your first attempt is more than enough okay now if you like today's discussion like comment and share it with your friends for more updates regarding upsc preparation subscribe to shankar ias academy youtube channel thank you